Hi, everybody, and welcome. Um, this is uh, to, to the Brookline Friends of Public Health meeting. If you um, are not a member of the Brookline Friends of Public Health, this is an organization that has been in business since um, 1997. We have um, over 150 members who um, have a, who are promoting local involvement in public health, and I invite you to become a member. Um, I, my name is Larry Maddow, I'm the uh, co-president, along um, with Cheryl Lefton here, who's the other co-president, and we'll uh, meet in a few minutes. Um, just to briefly, tonight's, uh, tonight's um, event is, uh, we're, we're really here to meet, and, and mostly to hear from Dr. David Hemingway, who's going to that, to uh, present what turns out to be an unfortunately all too timely um, talk on gun violence and, and public health. Um, I also want to invite any of you who are members of the Brookline Friends of Public Health to nominate yourself or nominate um, others to be a trustee um, of, of the Friends of Public Health. And so we are taking nominations and um, it's, it's, not, it's not a great deal of responsibility. We meet a couple of times a year, there's no um, fixed term limit for this um, honorary position, I understand, but um, it, is, it is important that we, have, uh, that we have members. Tonight we're also um, going to um, present um, mini-grant awards to three groups uh, who have received mini-grants. It's one of the, the functions of the Friends of Public Health is to promote public health through these um, small grant awards, and you'll hear more about that in a few minutes. Um, why don't, um, before much longer, why don't I have Cheryl come up who's going to talk about the budget. This should take a, a minute. <laughs> Good evening, everyone. So, we have a, a short financial update to give you, and uh, the beginning balance of the Friends as of January of 2017 was $2,112.33. And in 2017, um, there was the um, Alan, the, the former director of Brooklyn Public Health, uh, Director Alan Balson's retirement party, and we raised $4,373.32. That coupled with the Friends Renewal, um, and then our expenses for that year um, was $2,811.62. And then we also had many grant awards in the amount of $1,200. So our grand total at the end of 2017 and our current budget is $2,474.00. Three cents. We have to get those three pennies in there. So we're, we're looking forward to generating a little bit more with your help. Um, it's also my pleasure to um, introduce tonight for his first um, meeting of the, of the Friends of Public Health, uh, Dr. Swanee Jed, who joined us um, not quite one year ago. He joined us on April 25th, 2017 as the Director of Health and Human Services for Brookline. Um, before coming here, um, he founded Jetstream Communications Consulting Group, and before launching his own firm, he was the Health Officer and Surgeon General for Seminole County in Florida from 2013 to 2016, and the Health Officer of Bullitt County Health Department in Kentucky from 2009 to 2013. He is passionate about improving communities and addressing issues involving the social determinants of health. Um, these include housing, women and men's health, tobacco, homelessness, gun violence, climate change, and health inequities. He is currently um, a major in the Rhode Island Air National Guard, so he's um, well prepared for the battles here in Brookline. And, uh, his most recent assignment um, with the National Guard was actually in Senegal, Africa, where he was assisting with the Ebola response. And in 2017, 2007, he received the Bronze Star Medal for serving in combat operations during Operation Iraqi Freedom. 
He is a national leader in public health. He was president of the National Association of County and City Health Officers, NACHO, from 2015 to 2016. Um, he's authored numerous publications and acquired millions of dollars for local health department infrastructure over his 20-year career. We hope, he, we hope he's equally successful here in Brookline. Um, Dr. Jett holds a doctorate in public health with an emphasis on preventive medicine from the University of Kentucky and also a Master's of Science uh, from the University of Tennessee in Biosystems Engineering. And he got his Bachelor of Science from Tennessee State University. Dr. Jett. So welcome everyone. Uh, this is our second event of Public Health Week. Um, yesterday was an exciting uh, speaker, uh, Dr. Philip Duffy, talked about climate change and impacts on human health. So if any of you missed it, um, we are filming it, uh, at least we filmed yesterday through V8, so it will be online. And hopefully we will make sure we get online soon. I haven't seen anybody back there, but hopefully. Uh, so as we move forward, I want to first, uh, through the donations that we received, we actually awarded grants to the community. And this year we sort of did a little bit different. We actually provided advertisements in the newspaper. So we made an announcement. And <clears throat> the first awarded the grants were $400 and it had to really deal with something in public health. So we really didn't have a criteria set before but we wanted to make sure that grants sort of had some impact. So there was a lot of deliberation among some of the trustees. And next year we will have a, a better process in place. But this was our first stab at it. And so we gave out three grants. The first grant um, was Climate Action Brookline was awarded for us to cover cost of implementation and publicizing of many of these events, which this year we had an opportunity to work with uh, Climate Action Brookline, and we sort of merged some of our events, and last night's talk was our first stab at it. Um, the event highlights low carbon, food, biking, renewable energy, climate change, green spaces, and providing the community of Brookline with various educational and hands-on activities throughout the week. So Climate Action Brookline, uh, we merged Monday's event and this Saturday's event, and they actually kick off Climate Week starting Sunday. So do we have any representatives from BPAN? Please step forward and receive the check of $400. Yeah. Thank you. 
And the last recipient is Brookline Farmers Market. Uh, Brookline Farmers Market Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program, SNAP, match program. The SNAP program and doubles the purchasing power of customers using SNAP dollars with a 100% match. Um, the dollars per market in order to purchase local food, nutritious food, actually this is a pretty good farmer's market I've visited several times, just to purchase honey. <laughs> this program has been very well successful in the past. Unfortunately, they ran out of money, so um, they want to increase awareness and use the program more, and they're trying to look for more funding in the range of eight to $10,000. So this is just a small contribution to Brooklyn Farmers Market. So who's here to receive this check? Yes, please come forward. I say you're And you sign? No, I just signed. She signed. Oh, I appreciate it. Public health and taking hands today. I just want to say something. Sorry, I'm sure it's not time to make a speech. But th this isn't a small amount of money, it's a large amount of money, and it's super useful, and just, I've only been the volunteer director of the market, which has been around for 35 years for the last four, and the first year, I was involved in the market, um, I didn't know who Lynn Karsten was, and I was really scared the market would fall apart, it would be in my head, and so, Lynn would come around and say, I don't know if you remember this, like, like you know, like, can't you get it together to do snap here at this market? And I was like, oh, I don't know what I'm doing. Know what I'm doing. And, and you know, let me get my feet under me. And then I think you came around the second market too. And when we got all set up for the second season, we did $500 in snap that ran through the market. The second season, we put in the matching program because people told us you really need to match people's dollars and push money out of the community to make it really accessible. We did $5,000. Um, Last year, third year, we did $20,000 for the department. 10,000 of which we raised from some incredibly generous, anonymous citizens of Brookline, which I just want to say thank you, even though I can't recognize them. And so, you know, and we piece it together, all this match money, and some of it's in $5 donations, and some of it's in many thousands, and this is, you know, it just all goes straight back out to people who, who come use their SNAP, and so I'm super appreciative of it. You. trustees tonight, this being our, our annual meeting. And so um, there is a slate of trustees which was printed on this um, brochure that you may have seen on the way and I'll read their names. Are there any additional nominations for trustees tonight? Would anybody? Yes. I'm Kitty Kaufman. Kitty? Kaufman. 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 Okay, <laughs> great. Um, okay, so we have one, one other nominee. And um, I'm going to read the slate here. Uh, any, any other nominees? The, the rest of the slate is Carol Axelrod, Swanee Jett, uh, Jacques Carter, Lloyd Gellano, Sharon Gordetsky, John Hermos, Lynn Karsten, Dai Nguyen, Gloria Rudish, Richard Segan, Anthony Schloff, and Gretchen Stoddard. Um, so those are the nominees. So could I have um, a show of hands in favor of the nominees? Okay. All right, the, uh, the slate is carried, and I think we're done with our official business for tonight. Yeah. 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 All right, so before we uh, go into the hot topic, what is happening around the country. Um, I first have an award to give out. And last year this award was, it's usually our public health leadership award and a person has to make a significant impact on public health in Brooklyn. So the award was renamed last year to the Dr. Island Boston Award. And before I read his long list of accomplishments, um, I want to say this, I met this person 
you know, and visually, personally, just to have some conversations with them. And, you know, I was very awed uh, because I, you know, did a lot of conversations and a lot of media interviews and a lot of op-ads. So if you read the tab, I wrote an op-ad on gun violence and, and why is this significant in terms of how we should treat it and look at it. But the real author of the work that I've been reviewing all these decades is none other than Dr. Um, Hemingway. So I want to bring him forward to receive the Dr. Alan Balson Public Health Leadership Award. Thank Now, he's such a great leader that he also taught Dr. Slop, but he said right there. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, Dr. Hemingway is an economist and a professor at Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health and a former James Marshall Visiting Professor at the University of Vermont. He is director of Harvard Injury Control Research Center former director of the Harvard Youth Violence Prevention Center, and former president of the Society for the Advancement of Violence and Injury Research. He received the Excellence in Science Award for the American Public Health Association and fellowships from the Pew, the Cyrus, and Robert Wood Johnson Foundations. In 2012, he was recognized by CDC of one of the 20 most influential injury and violence professionals over the past 20 years. In 2013, he received a commissioner's commendation from the Boston Police Commission for exemplary services to the people of Boston. Dr. Hemingway has written over 200 journal articles, more than 100 on gun violence, and five books, including Private Guns and Public Health, which somebody he signed for today. So if anybody else has a book, I mean, you know, I'm not trying to make sure he signs everybody's autograph on his book, but, but if you have your books, he will sign them. Um, and while he also wrote a book, While We Were Sleeping, Success Stories of Injury and Violence Prevention in 2009, Dr. Hemingway has received 10 Harvard Teaching Awards. So welcome, uh, Dr. David Hemingway. A number of years ago, Howard Coe, who was Commissioner of Public Health and a friend of mine, uh, got some award and I saw him and I said, oh, this is great, you won this award, and, you, and he said, I didn't deserve it at all. He said, but I've done so many things in life where I haven't gotten the award support, and I'm just going to grab this one, and this is the way I feel about this. This is, you know, wonderful, so I'm taking it, so thank you. <laughs> Uh, so I'm going to talk today uh, pretty quickly about lots and lots of things about guns. So I'm going to talk uh, about uh, just that it's a big problem, uh, what the public health approach is, because people don't quite seem to understand it. Uh, how important data and funding really are, and then a success story really about preventing suicide. Uh, I don't know what. All right, so, so uh, you know, I promised my publisher this is only about $20 on Amazon.com. <laughs> okay, I, I need help here. I don't know why. Why sometimes it goes. Okay. All right, let's see. Anyway, so this is a big uh, public health problem. You can see you know, more people have died since I graduated from college uh, in the United States uh, than from guns than on all the battlefields in the history of the United States, including the Civil War, World War II, and so forth. Uh, and on an average day, uh, we have 300 people shot, about 100 die, and then you have so many criminal incidents and uh, incidents of partner violence. Um, lots of suicides, um, about half of all suicides are firearm suicides, many more suicides than uh, homicides. 
uh, three quarters of all our homicides are firearm homicides, and so a lot. And the key thing to recognize is that there are about two dozen high-income countries, or um, if you want to call them industrialized democracies, or we used to call them first world countries, maybe. Uh, and we really are different. Uh, but we're not different about what people think. We actually don't have more crime than these other countries. Uh, countries like Canada or Germany or Japan or New Zealand or Italy. Uh, we are an average country uh, in terms of all non-gun crime. We're an average country in terms of violence. When you uh, look at our bullying rates in schools, we are an average. We seem to have similar uh, aggression rates among school children, depression rates. Among, we just look like a regular high income country. But we have one big difference in that we have lots, lots more guns, particularly handguns. Uh, and we have by far the weakest gun laws of any developed country in the world. And not surprisingly, I would say we have enormous problems. This is just gives you a feeling of some of the problems. This is five to 14 year olds. These are children. Uh, it's the reason I'm going to show some slides about this group is because it's there's so much victim blaming uh, in this area, and it's really hard to blame uh, five to fourteen year olds. It's basically K through eight. And how are we doing as a country? We, you know, we, we are the most armed country uh, in the world in terms of developed countries. How are we doing protecting our children? And what this uh, slide says is compared to these other high income countries, lots more of our children die from guns, from gun homicide, and it's not like 20% you know, higher or 50% higher or twice as higher or four times as high. It's 18 times higher. 18 times. If you took all the children in the developed world, so this is the United Kingdom, it's um, Norway, it's Australia, it's, North, it's South Korea, it's every one of the two dozen developed countries, and you lined up all the bodies of five to 14 year olds who have been murdered by guns, well, about 90% of those little children would be American children. Um, we are an average country in non-gun homicide, same way in suicide uh, for children. Um, kids flunk a class or um, you know, something terrible happens to him. Uh, he thinks and he goes home, he's horribly depressed, he finds his dad semi-automatic, bang, he's dead. Our gun suicide rate among these children is 11 times higher. Uh, our intentional firearm death rate is 12 times higher. We are not protecting our children. And people around the world look at us and think, what kind of parents, what kind of adults are we? Um, there's lots of evidence within the United States that when there's more guns, there's more death. Why? Because there's more homicide, because there's more gun homicide, more suicide, because there's more gun suicide, more unintentional firearm deaths. This again, this is just gives you a flavor this is not a study. The study, we try to explain why do some states do better than others in terms of protecting children, in terms of violent death. Uh, and this just looks at the high and the low gun states to give you a feeling for the size of the difference. And so you're not looking at rates, you're looking at actual children dead. So this is the most recent 10 years we have data on. And we looked at the very high gun states, states with a lot of guns. Uh, per capita, meaning that means household gun ownership, states with very low guns. Uh, high, high guns are basically the mountain states in the south, the red states, uh, states with low guns, uh, Hawaii, Massachusetts, where I'm from and you're from, Rhode Island, New Jersey, where the Sopranos are from, <laughs> uh, Connecticut, and New York, which has lots of problems. Uh, and this just says, all right, there's about the same number of kids in these states in this 10-year period. There are about 54, 50 or 54 million kid years um, of exposure. And what you see, if you look at the second from the bottom, unintentional firearm deaths, there were 10 kids in the Logan states in this 10-year period who unintentionally got kid, killed with a firearm compared to 129 in the high gun states. So it's about a 12-fold difference. The kid was more likely to be killed unintentionally in the high-end. In terms of gun suicides, there are 28 in the low-end states, 264 in the high-end states, even though you've got the same number of kids. It looks like there's a little difference in non-gun suicide, but when you look at all 50 states, there's no relationship at all between household gun ownership and non-gun suicide. Uh, if, and, and if you look at gun homicides, 
instead of being 10 or 12 time fold difference, it's only a two fold difference. 117 kids in the low gun states compared to 274 in the high gun states. Why isn't there this big eight fold difference? And the answer is because homicide guns move. Uh, you know, when someone is killed uh, in a homicide in Massachusetts, where did the gun come from? And typically it did not come from Massachusetts. Uh, these guns are brought into the, into the state. When someone is killed with a gun in uh, New York, where did the gun come from? Not from New York State. Uh, when someone is killed with a gun in New Mexico, where did the gun come from? New Mexico. Uh, so these states who have weak laws and lots of guns are not our good neighbors. Uh, this just looks at women. You see the same sort of thing. Uh, you know, our guns, uh, these states with uh, lots of guns and um, very strong law and very weak laws, are they protecting women? The answer is no. Women are really dying there from unintentional firearm deaths, from gun suicides, and so they have a higher suicide rate from gun homicides, so they have a higher homicide rate. And you look at any age group, you can look at whatever. Uh, police. Uh, police in the United States, a police officer in the United States is 30 times more likely to be killed on the job than a police officer in Germany. 30 times per, per law enforcement officer. And we, again, we can look at where are police being killed? Why is, are they killed more often in some states than others? And the answer is one word, and the answer is guns. Uh, this again, is just not the study you control for everything, but this just shows in the high gun states, uh, there's lots of guns. Uh, in the low gun states, there are very few um, law enforcement officers killed. Uh, you have the same number of law enforcement officers we match, so you get uh, the high and low gun states with the same. Uh, this was population of LEOs, law enforcement officers. 85 were killed in the low gun states in this, I guess, 15-year uh, period. Uh, 263 in the high gun states, about a three-fold difference. Uh, we're just looking now at where civilians are being killed by police. Where are you much more likely? Why do some states, a lot of civilians are killed per capita compared to other states? And the answer is guns. Guns. Um, now, these are population effects. Um, you know, many firearm deaths in terms of other people shooting you. How about a gun in your own home? Uh, it, what's the benefits and costs? Um, and what the evidence is, is that a gun in the home increases the risk of gun accidents, duh, of course. Uh, it really increases the risk for suicide, and I want to talk about that a fair amount. And what we know is that a gun in your house increases the chance that a woman in that house is going to be murdered. Um, I'll talk about the, the, the evidence about uh, suicides in a, in a minute. Now, what's the public health approach? Why do we push the public health approach? Uh, we push it because we think it works and it's very effective. Um, the nice thing is that people now sort of like to talk about the public health approach. I looked up on Google uh, and wrote public health approach in quotes, and this is what came up. People have talked about, let's use the public health approach for bereavement, for cyber security, for fracking for gambling, for justice reform, for malware propagation, for obesity, for parenting, for war. And so everyone is saying, let's use the public health approach. I think they have no idea what it means, but it sounds good. And that's good for public health because they're saying, hey, let's use it. Now, let me tell you what I think the public health approach is. This, this is what the CDC says it is, and I never understood that this is like the, the sort of scientific approach to an issue. The, that, that's not what I think is the public health approach. What I think the public health approach is is this. If you ask me to define it in one sentence, it would be, let's create a world where it's easy to stay healthy and a world where it's difficult to get sick or injured. That's what a public health approach is. What does that mean? If you just want to reduce obesity in the United States, what you should do is make it really easy to get good and nutritious and healthy food, make it really hard to get junk food make it really, really easy and cheap to exercise well and make it really hard never to exercise. And we do sort of just the opposite in the United States for most people and we're surprised that we have a lot of obesity. Um, the five keys to the public health approach, we've spent a lot of time for the last 35 years trying to differentiate the public health approach to say the, uh, the medical care approach or the criminal justice approach. Uh, and the first thing is that the public health approach is about prevention. Now, uh, medical care and cr uh, criminal justice talk about prevention, but 
all the money, 98% of the money is after the fact. Somebody gets sick and you'd have to treat them. Somebody commits a crime and you have to do something. In public health, 98% of the money is spent trying to prevent the bad thing from happening uh, in the first place. And what we've learned is that for any bad incident, uh, there's probably a dozen or more things that could have prevented any one incident, bad incident, from occurring. And what you don't want to do, typically, if you want to cost effectiveness, is try to wait till the very last second and try to say, stop, don't have that bad thing happen. Um, what you really want to do is typically go far upstream and to prevent this is the most cost effective way of preventing a problem. I'll talk about this. Second, what's the public health approach? The public health, it's about not individuals, but about populations. So, what does that mean? If I was going to talk about suicide, say, to um, psychiatrists, which I have one of the questions I'll let's say to them is why do you think it is, here we are in Massachusetts, why do you think it is that uh, in Arizona, uh, which is about the same population of, of Massachusetts, that three times as many people commit suicide. And there's, you know, pause, and most of them, if they're truthful, say, gee, I didn't know that. And why should they? That, that's not what they're interested in. They're interested in why, you know, Sally is feeling bad and how to make her feel a little better. Um, but what public health is interested in is these populations. And then if I push them a little further, they might say, why, you know, why, is, is Arizona so bad? Maybe, you know, maybe there aren't enough psychiatrists, maybe it's, you know, maybe it's the weather, maybe it's the, you know, it's the Hispanic, maybe, well, they don't know, they have no idea. And what's the answer? Yes. Guns. Right. Um, public health is about a systems approach, which I'll talk about, trying to create a system where it's easy to stay healthy and hard to get hurt. Um, public health is really about, if there's a problem, Let's get all society by and let's agree that it's a societal problem. Let's step back and think, how can we as a society solve this problem? How can everybody play their role in trying to do something about this problem? And so public health is really not about blame. The only thing we talk about blame is, is if it improves prevention, which typically it doesn't. Mostly in the United States, people like to blame. And once they blame, they wash their hands and it's somebody else's problem. And in public health, we like to talk about bringing everyone together and shared responsibility. Um, the, the, one of the big um, success stories, there's so many success stories in public health, which is why I'm always so optimistic. Uh, one of them is in motor vehicles. This is the story we, uh, in the injury field, uh, when we, we bring our graduate students together over the campfire, we tell them the story. And it's passed on from generation to generation, and it's a just so story, it's about 90% correct. Um, so, most motor vehicle crashes are due to driver error. What does that mean is that drivers never made mistakes you'd have very, very few crashes. If there were no tired drivers, if there were no distracted drivers, if there was no um, angry drivers, if people were always perfect. <laughs> and because of that, it used to be, hey, let's educate and train drivers. I'm from a generation where uh, everybody in my cohort in Illinois, when I was there, had to take drivers in. And what the evidence now shows is that drivers that let us drive sooner and die younger. Um, most motor vehicle deaths are due to people deliberately breaking the law. If nobody ever broke the law, we would have eliminated probably 60, 70 percent of our motor vehicle deaths. Has speeding, has anyone here ever spent? Um, you know, drunk driving, uh, running red lights. If we can eliminate all those things, we can do great. So what should we do? Let's eliminate all this and let's enforce the traffic laws. And we try. Uh, it wasn't until the 1950s that public health physicians asked a different question, not who caused the crash, but what caused the injury. It was very clear a lot of people were being speared by steering columns that didn't collapse, their faces were lacerated uh, by windshields that were not made of safety glass. They were thrown from the car and their heads would hit the cement or the uh, the hood. Uh, why? Because there are no seat belts and airbags and public health physicians saying, why can't we make the car safer? And the automobile manufacturers were implicitly saying over and over as loud as they could, cars don't kill people, drivers kill people. Cars don't kill people, drivers kill people. Let's focus on the drivers. 
Um, and public health physicians say, well, can we make the cars, can we make the roads safer? Why are we putting these um, lampposts all along the sides of major roads? When you leave the road for one second, you hit a lamppost. We've never looked in our history, found anyone who lost control of the car, went off the road into a field and died. Uh, we're not putting lampposts along the sides of major uh, airport runways. Why are we doing it along the sides of highways? Can we make the highway safer? And, uh, can we make the emergency medical system safer? And so the punchline is really nobody thinks drivers today are better than they were in the 1950s. We're uh, a little better today about drunk driving. We're a lot worse about distracted driving. Uh, but still, fatalities per mile driven in the last 55 years have fallen about 85%. If you go back a little further, it's 90%. What that means is that for every 20 kids you know, in some high school who die over a decade uh, in the past, only three will die. Not perfect, but it's an incredible success story without really doing anything much about the individual driver because that's not what's most cost effective to do. So the key insight is you don't have to change people to make great progress. And indeed, what you want to do is you want to make a system where it's hard to make mistakes, a system where it's hard to behave inappropriately, and if some people still make mistakes and still make, behave inappropriately, you want a system where nobody gets seriously hurt. So what is an example is you're driving in Los Angeles and it's really, really late at night, so you're actually moving fairly fast and you're so tired and you're on the freeway and you're about to go to sleep and your eyes can barely stay open and suddenly they close and your car starts swerving and Pete's going to say, it's your fault, you shouldn't have driven like this, you, just, you know, you get killed somebody, you might kill yourself and then suddenly, bop, 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 you hit these bot stops which are along the sides of the lane and you wake up and you pull back into the lane and everything's fine. And that's what you really want, that's the sort of thing. Now, we've done better and better about living with cars. We still could do even much better, but we've made a lot of improvements. That's not the case with firearm. Uh, we have lots of firearms. We probably have a lot. You know, most places in the United States will always have a lot of firearms. Uh, we have to do better about having firearms. Uh, public health is often a harm reduction approach. That's what I want to talk about. We can make a lot of changes in the firearm itself to make it safer. Uh, we can make a lot of changes in the distribution system. We can make a lot of changes in social norms about guns. Uh, in the automobile area, there were lots of problems there where we had to solve. We had to worry about pedestrians. We have to worry about bicyclists. We have to worry about motorcyclists. We have to worry about uh, rollovers. We had to worry about uh, frontal collisions. We had to worry about fires after the, after the car crashed, and on and on and on and on. In the same way in the firearm area, we have to worry about accidents and assaults. We have to worry about uh, intimidation uh, by guns, which is very serious. We have to worry about homicides, and suicides, we have to worry about gang violence and mass shootings and whatever. And what there, there's ne not necessarily one solution that's going to solve the problem. Uh, the same way, like I worked for Ralph Nader in the 60s and we pushed the airbag. The airbag was wonderful, but uh, it re reduced motor vehicle crash deaths by about 10, 11 percent, which is a lot, but it didn't save pedestrians and it didn't save your rollovers and it didn't save motorcyclists and on and on and on. Now, uh, Swani mentioned this. This is uh, th this, this book I wrote, which is a wonderful book. It was, it was written about for my parents and my students. Um, and this again, this is only $30 at Amazon.com. Uh, and basically, this is 64 documented successes about how the world's been made safer while we were sleeping, which is public health and that. And one of the many important uh, lessons I learned uh, from this and was so happy about was data and research are actually incredibly important in all these successes. They actually matter. Uh, among the uh, very various uh, ways they mattered, one was to show that there was a problem and get buy-in. Yes, there really is a problem. Second, to indicate the policies that could be effective. And third, to evaluate those policies. So uh, to give a quick example, um, in uh, the motor vehicle area, the data showed that 16-year-olds were incredibly high risk of getting killed, uh, three times the risk of 19-year-olds who are not good drivers, 10 times the risk of 40-year-olds. Uh, what can we do? We have to get, these kids have to get some experience. We don't have self-driving cars yet for everybody. We don't have uh, simulators for everybody. How can we get these kids experience without having so many die? Uh, one of the things the data showed was that there were two periods where there was incredibly high risk, uh, much higher than you could imagine. One was at night and one was when other, only other teenagers were in the car. 
So following New Zealand, the state of Michigan said, all right, we're going to try to save some 16-year-olds. What we'll do is we'll let 16-year-olds drive, but not at night and not when only other teenagers are in the car. Uh, they passed the law. Two years later, we had enough data to evaluate it. It had decreased. It wasn't perfect success, but it decreased fatalities among these 16-year-olds by 30%. Significant. Then other states, other states tried it, and they found sort of the same thing. And so, within like eight years, all 50 states in the United States have graduated driver's licensing, and a lot of kids are safe. And it's a nice success. Um, we don't have nearly enough data in the firearms area, and when we have the data, data have been both deliberately not collected, uh, and when they have been collected, they've been deliberately withheld from researchers. And I could go through all those. Uh, the research dollars have been deliberately not provided for researchers. I always say public health is underfunded relative to medicine within public health. The injury area is very underfunded. Uh, even though you're more likely to die of an injury if you're before the age of 40 than a disease, at the CDC only 2% of, of dollars are for injury rather than disease. Uh, and within the injury area, firearms research is particularly underfunded compared to the size of the problem. Here's what happened with CDC funding. Um, it started very low at $2.56 million, which is nothing uh, for uh, research at the national level. And it went down to zero very quickly because of threats from the uh, gun lobby. Uh, this just gives the National Institute of Health that it step up. Here's 40 years of funding uh, from 1973 to 2012. Uh, there were, for the collar of the theory of polio and rabies, which accounted for a little over 2,000 cases, uh, there were close to 500 research awards, which is fine, but for guns, which accounted for about 4 million cases, there were three research awards. Uh, people have tried to look at um, how much research would be, would you expect? One person looked at, uh, for youth age 1 to 17, firearms account for 13% of the deaths. Uh, you would expect that about 13% of the publications uh, of, these, uh, of these 10 leading causes of death would be about firearms. Instead of 13%, 0.3%. Uh, here's another way of looking at it. This is for, uh, you look at all deaths, how much, how important is firearms? Um, and uh, what you would have predicted was that there would have been $1.4 billion over a 10 year, over, I guess that's a 12 year period for firearms research. Instead, there was $0.022 billion. Uh, you would have expected about 40,000 publications in the public health medical literature, and you've got less than 2,000. So uh, people, uh, reporters always say, oh, what do we need more research on? You know, what's the two things we need? And it's like, no. We, we know not, nothing. Is you scratch the surface about anything. Um, we do a lot of research. We are the most productive, I think, research team because we've written about over 100 journal articles over a 25-year period, uh, almost 30-year period now. Last year, we wrote the first ever peer-reviewed journal article about gun training. Uh, what? You know, we, we sent people out to, um, 20 to, to, take, to take the basic gun training classes uh, and found out incredible things about what's really being taught at these classes. Last year, we wrote the first article ever about gun theft, even though it's, we estimate, and other people estimate, that three to 500,000 guns a year are stolen in the United States. What do we know about the who, what, why, when, and how? And the answer is nothing. There's never, had never been a peer-reviewed journal article about gun theft until last year. On and on. There's never, as far as I know, there's not a single journal article about open carry. Oh. Um, you name it, we just know almost nothing. You know, so, um, gun manufacturers and gun dealers have incredible protections offered to no other industry. Uh, there's no federal agency that has oversight safety for, for guns. Uh, I think there's only one other product in the whole United States where there's no federal agency that has jurisdiction over the safety. Uh, it's, they've made it almost impossible to sue the gun manufacturers with special laws, and the ATF, which is supposed to oversee gun dealers, has been, their hands have been tied in innumerable ways, such as they can't use computers for some of the things they do. It's like, what? Uh, still, there's lots being done. I want to give you some examples. Uh, uh, one of the things uh, we're trying to do, we tried to do in the 2000s, 
uh, is create a good data system for um, Boston. Uh, their data systems really matter. Uh, there's a great data system for motor vehicles. Whenever there's a motor vehicle crash and in death, there's uh, like 140 pieces of information collected consistently and comparably across states and over time. So we know so much. We have really good, good evaluations. Uh, we didn't have that of guns, and we helped try to create the National Violent Death Reporting System. Um, let me talk about why this is important. Um, so let's just sort of look at children. Um, unintentional firearm deaths to children. Uh, there's two horrible gun researchers who are cited all the time by the National Rifle Association. Uh, and they say crazy things. One is, is John Lott. And over and over, for example, he's been on and on saying, quote, about two-thirds of accidental deaths to children are not shots fired by other little kids, but rather adult males with criminal backgrounds. <coughs> All right, so if that were really true, we probably should do something about adult males. If we wanted to reduce unintentional firearm deaths to children, where's the citation? Where's the evidence? He never cites it. He just writes these op-eds, which are published in the LA Times and, and talks on Fox News continuously about things like that. So what we did is, because we have a national fire violence death reporting system, we looked at the data. Uh, we found that the, the, um, the vital statistics data, which most people use, was good for a lot of things, but it was not good for an intentional fire death to children. It missed almost half of them. Uh, why did it miss them? Because uh, what it would do is, uh, if uh, some kid found his dad, the 11-year-old finds his dad semi-automatic, he takes out the magazine, he thinks it's unloaded, he plays with it, there's a bullet left in the chamber, he pulls the trigger, it goes off. Mostly nothing bad happens, sometimes he kills his younger brother, sometimes he kills his best friend. Most medical examiners in the United States count that as a, not an accident, but a homicide because it's man, as manslaughter, it puts him in homicide because he pulled the trigger intentionally. It's a pure accident, he loves his best friend, he loves his brother, he didn't want anything bad to happen. When you put those where they're supposed to go, where the National Violent Death Reporting System does, you get you know, almost, again, uh, almost twice as many deaths. And then you look at the data, and what is it? It's not adult males with criminal backgrounds who are killing these kids, it's kids killing these kids. So this is zero to 14 year olds, this is up through basically eighth grade. Uh, one third of the, uh, Deaths are self-inflicted. One third are other children as shooters. An 11-year-old shoots a 11-year-old. One sixth are slightly older teenagers. A 15-year-old shoots a 14-year-old. They may be in the same grade. And, um, and then a third, uh, and then about a sixth uh, are adults, and almost all of them are parents. And there's no evidence that uh, these parents are criminals. Um, but what does the evidence do show? When you start looking at it, it's so important to get the evidence to figure out what to do. Again, most children are killed by somebody else, except for two to four-year-olds. Two to four-year-olds who have a slightly higher rate of unintentional firearm death uh, than the, the younger the younger, and younger cohorts uh, are mostly killing themselves. And what happens? They find their dad's you know, pistol, they, they, pistol, they're able, they point it toward their face, they're able with their little thumbs to pull the trigger and they did that. Um, 11 to 12 and 13 to 14 year olds are often killed, not at home where most kids are killed, uh, but at a friend's house. So what does that say? Uh, you know, you find out these things and you say, well, what can we do? Well, for two to four year olds, we know what to do, it's not that hard. Uh, we used to have a big problem for two to four year olds that they would find aspirin bottles and take a lot of aspirin and died, and now we have childproof aspirin bottles and they're a little annoying to get off sometimes, but they've saved large numbers of children. We can have childproof guns. Indeed, a hundred, over 100 years ago, Wesson of Smith & Wesson fame produced childproof guns because he was worried about children. The way he did it was, uh, if you, you wanted the gun to, to fire, you had to, at the same time you pulled the trigger, just put a little pressure on the handle. And as kids had trouble pushing down to, uh, to open the aspirin bottle, they had trouble doing that. And, uh, you could save a lot of kids. Um, the, I think the ask campaign, if you have a, a, a young child uh, and they go to a friend's house, you probably should ask if they have a gun. But it's probably not this. I have a nine-year-old daughter. It probably doesn't matter for her uh, because, again, if you look at the data, um, it, it's almost all boys. And if you're until you reach 11 years old, it's, it's you're not going to kill your friend's house. 
But if you have an 11, 12, 13, 14 year old boy, you should really ask. It's less than crucial in Massachusetts, but it's crucial in most places. And then if you read the cases, what is the common, you know, commonality for almost large, large numbers of these cases? The, only, the large majority is the kid says, I didn't know the guy was loaded. I just didn't. Uh, what can you do? Hey, let's blame the kid. Hey, let's blame the parent. Let's blame, blame, blame. Or let's do what public health said, let's solve the problem. How can we solve the problem? It's pretty easy. You make it so that every semi-automatic, when you take out the magazine, yeah, it can have a bullet left, but it won't fire. And some semi-automatics will like this, every semi-automatic be like this, and we would save lots and lots of kids' lives. We know how to do it. It's not high tech. We just don't. Because uh, the manufacturers don't want to do it. It's the same way you go to the big manufacturers. It took 20 years to force them to put airbags in cars. Mm -hmm. um, and then we should have safe storage. We have terrible storage practices in the United States. We should have smart guns. What's a smart gun? It means. Um, so a number of years ago, my car I was broken into and someone stole the radio. The next car I bought had a little sign on the window that said, this radio will not work if it leaves the car. Uh, and that really helped reduce uh, uh, theft of uh, uh, radios. We, we've had, this, we've had an over a 90% drop in motor vehicle theft in the United States over the last 40 years. Why is that? It's because kids are much better now than they used to be now, right? It's because it's really hard to steal cars now. When I was young, it was not hard to hotwire a car. Now, you can't, and you know, there's so many things to prevent. Smart gun makes it really hard. It says, you steal my gun, you can't use it. Go ahead, steal it, but you won't be able to use it. Um, and there's lots of ways sort of to do that. Now, um, what would happen? Uh, Something, I, I, I screwed up here. So what I'm going to do, I don't know what have, but what I'm just going to do, uh, and then I'll stop and I'll stop in five minutes, is just talk about suicide. I don't know what happens in the slides, but um, so most people who think about suicide think about mental health. Uh, we don't think about mental health uh, in our group. What we think about is the means of suicide. It turns out that. The great success stories of suicide prevention in the 20th century had nothing to do with mental health. What were they? One was in England. Uh, what happened is people, about half the people who died in the suicide in the 1940s, 50s, uh, and you'll see if you ever you know, watch the old movies, they would put their heads in the oven, uh, which was a pretty, pretty good way to die. It was painless and not disfigured. Uh, what happened is when they discovered the North Sea gas uh, that this didn't have any carbon monoxide in it, they put it in all the uh, stoves, and so people could still put their heads in the oven, but after a while you get bored and take your head out of them. <laughs> so suicide by putting your head in the oven went down to zero, suicide by other means didn't change at all. Tremendous success story. Uh, Sri Lanka, what happened? They used to kill themselves in Sri Lanka. Sri Lanka, about 15 years ago, was the highest the high suicide rate in the world. There they drink liquid pesticides. Mm -hmm. Just horrible, horrible, horrible. That's the news. It takes three days or so to die, and you can't turn it around. What did they do? They were using liquid pesticides, which had been banned throughout the developed world. They were so toxic. They said, all right, why don't we get rid of these most toxic pesticides? And they did it without affecting farming or anything. And people still take the pesticides, take the pesticides, but now most of them don't die. Tremendous success. Uh, the, the Israeli army, the Israeli army, there's a lot of people, kids, young, young people dying on the weekends when they take their guns home with them uh, and they kill themselves. Uh, the Israeli army said, this isn't such a good idea. And they banned you taking your, uh, your military weapon home on the weekends. So what happened to eliminate suicides on the weekends and there's no displacement at all. Uh, and this is success, success. Uh, in the United States, um, 
will be used as guns. Uh, only about 2% of all suicide attempts are with guns, but half of all suicide deaths are with guns. There has been 16 case control studies in the United States about suicide uh, and, and guns. What, uh, what a case control study is, is you basically get um, all the people, this, you know, group of, of suicides. You say, okay, here's all these people who committed suicide, let's match them up with people who look exactly the same as we can say, but didn't die in suicide. Maybe they attempted suicide, uh, maybe they had mental health problems, uh, and let's see what's the difference. And one of the things, the thing that jumps out by far is the people who are dead had guns. And the people who aren't dead didn't have guns in their uh, There have been a lot of what's called ecological studies. We do a lot of these trying to understand why do some cities, you look at all the cities, why does a lot of people die in suicide in some cities but not in others? What's going on? Uh, why are some, a lot of people dying in some states uh, from suicide but not in others? What's going on? Uh, and uh, what do we find? We find that uh, in the state level, for example, what does not explain virtually anything is mental health. Doesn't that, mental health doesn't matter, but mental health is pretty, seems to be pretty much the same across all the states. It doesn't explain this incredible difference. It's like a fourfold difference in suicide. In the high, in, in, uh, across the United States. You don't see that in virtually any disease. I mean, you don't see a fourfold difference in cancer or a fourfold difference in heart disease or a fourfold difference. You see it in suicide. What else does not explain it is suicide attempt. Suicide ideation doesn't explain it. There doesn't seem to be a big difference in suicide ideation explain it. Suicide attempts. Not like, oh my goodness, here's a state which has a lot of suicides, here's a state which doesn't. Are they attempting suicide more? And the answer is no. What explains it? Guns. Uh, and you can see in New England, for example, uh, I can show you, the, you know, if I can find it, I can show you the data that, um, you know, which states have high suicide rates in New England? Maine, Vermont, Maine, Vermont New Hampshire. You know? Which don't? Okay. Okay. Well, um, what's, how about the non gun suicide rate? It's basically the same in all the states. It's the gun suicide rates. And um, what, why? But why would guns matter? I mean, this is if somebody really wants to die. Well, well, the evidence is very strong that so many suicides are pretty spontaneous. There's all these studies where uh, that you talk to people, nearly lethal suicides, people who tried to commit suicide. It was not just a call for help. This was a not kidding around where you thought you were going to die. Most people thought you would die. You know, you shot yourself in the head. You jumped in front of a train and got hit. But somehow you lived, and then they talk to these people. Like, how long was it? You know, were you thinking about suicide when you decided, yes, I'm going to commit suicide, and then you did it? And um, you know, over half of them, it's like less than 15 minutes. Uh, it's just an incredible thing. Now, there's people who are 95 who have terminal cancer and in pain, and their wife just died, and, they, and they've been planning this, and fine. But for most people, that's it's pretty fun. Secondly, um, the Things wear off after a while. It's not like you have, okay, now I'm going to commit suicide and tomorrow I want to commit suicide and the next day I want to. No, things are blue and black now, but things get better. Uh, we have suicide watches in prison. Why is that? Because we know there are very dangerous periods, typically when you first get into prison, where you're very suicidal. And after that, you get used to it and it may not be great, but you're probably very, very unlikely to do it. Um, guns are incredibly lethal. The case fatality rate is about 90%. The case fatality rate for the most common thing people do, which is take 100 pills, is about 2%. If you can make it so instead of take shooting yourself, you take pills, basically medicine can save you. Uh, who does, you know, people who are hospitalists, they virtually never see gun suicides. Why is that? They go to the morgue. They don't, there's no reason to stop at the hospital. You're dead. So, People have been followed, these nearly lethal suicides have been followed for up to 20 years. What percent of them, so you tried to kill yourself, there's no kidding around, everyone thought you were gonna die. Now, we follow you until you die, or, or 20 years comes. What percent of those people go on to commit suicide? Less than 10%. So you save them, you save them. So there's, if we can just get, you know, Time and distance from the most lethal thing. 
which in the United States and common thing is gas. And so that's what we're trying to do. And we're really trying to um, work with um, gun owners and gun advocates. And this woman at my shop, Kathy Barber, has been doing this just incredible shop, things about getting people to understand about guns. So for example, uh, what she says is that um, 10 years ago, suicide experts in the United States never talked about guns. Partly they didn't understand how important they were, partly they knew, thought if they talked about guns, then the gun lobby would go after them and they didn't know how to let this in. Now, every you know, federal government plan, the VA plan, the Army plan, talks a lot about guns because it's so clear how important guns are if you want to reduce suicide. Secondly, 10 years ago, nobody in the gun area ever talked about suicide. And that's what we're changing right now. So um, there was uh, a, in New Hampshire, uh, a number of years ago, like eight, eight, six, eight years ago, uh, there, was, there were three suicides in a week in which the person had gone to the largest gun shop in New Hampshire, which is very small, there's so many gun shops. Uh, and bought a gun, and within that they killed themselves. And the, when the gun shop owner learned of it, he was de devastated. He thought, what can we do? And public health and uh, gun advocates and gun shop owners got together and said, what, how can we stop this problem? And one way, you can't solve all problems, but one way to do your part is that they said, all right, we will try to help reduce this type of suicide, uh, which is not the most common type, but it is an important type. Uh, so, in, we're going to train each other, we're going to uh, talk about this, here's this thing in, in Maryland. So if a, you know, a woman comes into your shop and says, I want a gun, and you say, what kind? And she says, I don't care. And you say, all right, how about this? She says, fine. You say, okay, how many bullets would you like? And she says, one. <laughs> don't sell her the gun. You don't need to sell, you know, get, help her get help. Uh, and so now, here we have, you know, here's the Maryland Licensed Firearm Dealers Association. And suddenly, they're talking about suicide. So there are now 20 states in the United States where gun dealers are actually talking about suicide and what they can do to prevent suicide. Um, Kathy went to Utah, which is the gun training capital of the United States. Um, and uh, she talked to people there who were gun trainers and the concealed carry classes. And she said, you know, you guys, you know, she always wants to make people part of the solution rather than part of the problem. She said, you guys are doing such a good job. We're, you know, we're doing enough about gun safety. She said, well, did you know that for every accidental gun death in Utah, that there are 30 gun suicides? 30 to one, they had no idea. And she said, would you like to try to help? So she said, how many people here know somebody personally who accidentally died, you know, who, who was accidentally killed with a gun and a couple of hands go up? She says, how many people here know somebody personally who died in a gun suicide? And every hand goes up. These are all these white guys. And they know. They own the guns. And she says, couldn't we sort of do something to, together? What, what if we work together and create a module about gun suicide for your training classes? Would you use it? And they said, well, let's see. And so they worked together and created this great module. And they love it. And then she said, well, how can we get other you know, trainers to use this? You know, how can we convince them? What kind of, you know, you know how to talk to them. And they said, we don't have to convince them. We know everybody in the state legislature. We'll just mandate it. <laughs> and so now Utah has mandated that in their gun carrying, concealed gun carry classes, that there's a suicide prevention module which is incredibly good. What does the module say? Basically, it says, the same as friends don't let friends drive drunk. Same principle is that your friend may be going through a bad patch. He just got divorced. He's drinking. He's talking crazy. He's at high risk. You as a good friend should, and he should understand that you should, quote, babysit, end quote, his gun for a while until things get better. He gets a new girlfriend. He can have his gun back. And they love it. They really buy in. It's, it's things like that that can really make a difference. And now, uh, if we can find a little funding, she's going to work with them to try to figure out how can we work together to try to prevent guns from getting into clearly wrong hands. Because 
Every gun in the United States is bought by someone who at least did not fail a background check. And yet somehow anybody can get any gun they want. And how does that happen and how can you reasonably uh, prevent that from happening? Uh, and um, so there's lots of good things going on. There's lots of things. There's so many, you know, we should have much better laws and so forth. But let me stop and just saying these are two wonderful books and they're on Amazon. <laughs> <laughs> data. So the Behavioral Respecter Surveillance System, by uh, the CDC, they, they interview, I don't know, 300 or so, it's hundreds and hundreds of thousands of people every year. And it's asking all these questions about health. So it's, you know, how, what, what percent of people, um, you know, have take, you know, do, have asthma, do something about their asthma, what percent of people have taken drugs in the past two years? It's all from there, whatever we know, it's right from there. They used to ask two questions like that. 2004, no more. So from there, you can get good percentages of guns. Now, we use proxies. Uh, it turns out the percent of suicides with guns, not the total number of suicides, but in a, you know, if there are 100 suicides in a state and only 10 of them with guns, they probably don't have many guns. Uh, if there are 100 suicides in a state and it has 60, 70 uh, gun suicides, they probably have a lot of guns. So we use sort of that now. But uh, as of 2004, yeah, there are some states probably went from about 10 to 60, 50, 60%. Uh, on average, what we've just done these surveys, and again, you know, we do these, and it's not, every 10 years we do this and nobody else does it, which is you know, how many guns really are out there, what's the average. So what we estimate is that about um, a, th a third of homes have guns. In the United States, about 22% of adults in the United States own guns, which means 78% don't, which means that three, to, three out of four of us are non-gun owners, or four out of five of us are non-gun owners, and yet all the guns which are being used were bought initially by these gun owners. Uh, what we find, too, is that um, there's more and more guns, but household gun ownership is actually decreasing fewer and people hunt, and, but the average gun owner owns more and more guns. Indeed, right now, I think two, two, it's, I think it's three percent of the U.S. adults own over half the guns in the United States. So three percent is still a lot of millions of people, but still, it's not like. Um, yeah. um, I have a question. I've heard a number years and years ago. I don't know if it's still accurate. Yeah. I didn't see it in your data. Yeah. What is the chances of it? If I have a gun in my home, what are the chances that I'll use it against a bad guy versus it'll be used either accidentally or suicidally? Yeah, against yeah. So, so, so we've done lots of work about uh, self-defense gun use, and it's hard to know what it means. But here's some things we do. If, if, if your home gun is used to kill somebody, you know how? It's like 90, it's 98 percent or something. It's going to be used in a gun accident against suicide or against your own family. It's almost never against a stranger. Um, if it's used to wound somebody, it's it's almost as high as that. Um, then the issue is: Are guns used to uh, scare away robbers, burglars? Because uh, almost everybody who owns a handgun owns it for protection. And owns it for protection against whom? Strangers. Now, strangers are not. If you get killed or raped, you know, raped or whatever by anybody, it's not going to be a stranger. It's like very, very, very unlikely. Don't be a stranger. It's it's going to be somebody you know for one thing. Um, the the what we know is that gun use and self defense is incredibly rare. So from the National Crime Victimization Surveys, which are these wonderful surveys which tell us how much crime we have, they say, all right, 60 to 80,000 people every six months are in a year. Uh, and they say, if anybody try to 
do this against you? Did anyone try to break into your house? Did anyone try to steal your car? Did anyone try to assault you? Whatever. And if you say yes, they say, what did you do? Um, and in less than 1% of contact crimes, we're using, it's not like somebody, you know, I wasn't around and somebody did something. In contact crimes where you see the other person, uh, in 0.9% of the time, the people said they used their guts. Okay. So the number I heard years ago was you were three times as likely to hurt yourself as someone else, but it sounds like it's much, much higher. Yeah, it, and it depends what hurt me, you know. I mean, um, the, you're very like, if the other thing that the, the data seems to show is if not having a gun doesn't mean you can't do anything, doesn't mean you're helpless, doesn't mean you're armed. So basically, in contact crimes, the victim does something, uh, I forget, about 60% of the time. Um, and uh, you can call the police, you can scream and yell, you can run away, you can use mace, you can hit somebody with a baseball bat, you can. You know, do whatever you can plead, <laughs> whatever it is. Uh, if if you do, basically, it, it depends on the year. But if you say use the gun in self defense, you're about four percent likely that you'll be hurt. If you did anything else, you're about four percent likely to be hurt. So it's just, there's just no evidence at all that it's very protective, and there's overwhelming evidence that it's of danger to you and your family. So for the average person, it, it's a terrible public health thing. So people in public health, the American Academy of Pediatrics says, get the gun out of your house because it's not protecting your children, it's endangering your children. Now you can imagine a case where, oh my goodness, I know someone's out to kill me and you know, I'm on a target and I know how to use a gun. And, you know, but you can imagine a case where wearing your seatbelt could hurt you. Yeah. As opposed to the yes. So, so there was a study. There was, there was a after the fact study where they looked at 198, basically 200 Atlanta uh, police reports where there was um, uh, it was a home invasion, basically. Somebody, so, so an unwanted entry where somebody was at home, uh, and in um, six percent of the time they got the gun before the homeowner did, and in three percent of the time the homeowner used the gun, and then the other. 90, what, not, not the gun, there's no, no, no guns weren't involved. Thank you. And my question is, um, how effective is uh, the gun buyback program? Is there any evidence that that is useful? Well, it's, the gun buyback is very nice. It's a small, you know, compared to how many guns there are, I think it's a very useful, nice thing. It, it, it mobilizes people. It gets some guns off the, off the, off, you know, out of people's houses and off the street. Um, there's no evidence that, oh my goodness, you have a gun buyback program and suddenly homicide goes down 20%. That's, uh, most of the guns are not the guns typically used in crime, so are. But it's very hard to get rid of guns in the United States often. Um, you, know, you try to get rid of a gun, and most police force say, we don't want your gun. And what, are you, what, are you, what are you supposed to do? Oh, sell it. I don't want to sell my gun. I, I want to get rid of the gun. And it's, and this is a nice way to, to do that. It's a nice way for, you know, if, you, if you're a grandmother and you're in this, you know, it's 15 year old grandson is living with you and you know he has a gun, this is a nice one to get rid of it now. So I think it's a very useful thing, but to imagine that, oh my goodness, we only had gun buybacks, then we could, you know, we, then most of the problem we saw was not. It seems to me that uh, most, one of the most important things in public health is education. Yeah. And I don't watch Fox News, but I just watch mainstream media, which is now false news. But anyway, when I watch, I still get the, I get a quite different view, uh, even from mainstream media, that, that guns seem to protect people. Because I think every time there is a home invasion where some guy shoots the perpetrator, it gets right. spread. You know, so you get the impression that guns, are, a lot of people get the impression, I don't know, right. that guns protect. That's, well, that's why the NRA is pushing that. Yes, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. That's a, and, and they're pushing guns everywhere. So we need more education yeah. on the other side. Yeah, it doesn't seem to be very good data. Uh, on it. Now, 
Again, the problem is it's, it's like it's hard for a good researcher to get up and say, oh, yes, the evidence is overwhelming that gun, you carry a gun, it's bad. Because there's not. There's not. Um, there's one good study about guns in the home about does it deter burglary. That was a big issue. Oh, if we only had, had guns in people's houses, then burglars. And what that did is it looked at the, 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 the county level and um, found that in places, you know, holding all the other things constant, found that in places where uh, there were more guns, meaning higher levels of household gun ownership, uh, there are actually a lot more burglaries. Uh, and the reason seemed to be because burglars like to get guns. I mean, if you're a burglar, what you really want are high value things that are easily portable. So they don't steal your refrigerator or your stove or they don't steal your toilet paper or whatever. What they want are is money, they want jewelry, and they want guns. So if you know, if you don't want your you know your burglar, don't put a big sign say I am I am you know gun collector. Loves them. This is the, most mass shootings. I get cold calls for two days, three days, by all these reporters and it's not. And this is sort of going on and on and on and on. And this is the first time ever that major corporations have run through the NRA. Never happened before. And so that's a really good sign. And, and they, they feel, you know, so the big issue is, is going to be when the gun lobby attacks these corporations. So so, so the second question is about um, you know, getting um, the, the bills. Uh, this is a, a big thing which uh, activists are pushing in most states, and it's so fine. A lot of things that I have trouble talking about, does it make sense that I'm for them? But I try to say, you know, what are the studies? Where is the really good evidence? And there's, like, here's, there's one study that sort of suggests problems. I would not hang my hat on the science. But there's a lot of things we don't in life which the science is. We don't have the science, it just makes sense. This is one comment that I thought I'd prove you haven't mentioned. It's um, the thing I don't want to use the automobile. Yeah. Uh, one of the players in the automobile that I love, of course, is the insurance company. Yeah. 
And so your behavior changes based on your agreement with them. Do you see any emotion? Well, there's, there's a lot of people who talk about that. Now there's one person I know who's really trying to, to, to entice the insurance companies to do something. Uh, the insurance company, it's illegal for insurance companies. The, the, the NRA is very good at those and uh, passing all these horrible laws. But it's illegal for insurance companies to penalize you because you have a gun. Oh, no, I'm sorry. I'm speaking more specifically about why is it that a gun owner isn't required to have a liability policy and use yeah. it? That would, that would be nice, but they haven't. They haven't been partly, mostly because they haven't been liable. What, why? Do you see any uh, public health side? We we would like to. We would love to use the you know, use insurance companies. And, uh, insurance companies. Once I started in injury prevention, I thought insurance companies would be great, and that they do all these things, and they do very well. It, it's amazing to me, and and they don't typically have an incentive. So so for example, just to give you a feeling, um, years ago I thought. Pushing the airbag, why don't insurance companies do something? It's clearly an easy thing. It's, it's, and then you think about it, it's because the insurance industry in some sense is balkanized across all these little different lines. So I, I get an airbag for my car. Who do I help? Which insurance do I help? Well, I help my life insurance. That's not who's, I help my health insurance. That's, right? I help, your, not my, but your car insurance. Because when you hit me, instead of me by dying, and your insurance company having to pay a lot of money, you have to pay very little, because now I'm saved. How much do I help my automobile insurance company? It's not, you know, most of the benefit goes elsewhere, so why should they care? And the answer is, they don't. In the same way, sort of, in the liability is that your gun gets stolen, we don't, people say, who cares? So all these guns are stolen, they're used, you know, they're brought in by you, they're stolen, they're used by somebody. You, you, have, no, you have no responsibility. And most gunners accept zero responsibility. It's amazing to me. You know, for most things, if you, if you bring in a machine gun, there's great responsibility. And machine guns aren't used hardly at all. Even though there are, I think, 100,000 or more machine guns in the United States. But it's very well licensed and whatever. Um, if you, you know, somehow you got your hands on dynamite or hand grenades, you'd be pretty liable. If, same way if somebody, you know, drowns in your swimming pool. But for somehow, there's, we have to change the liability laws. And then once you change the liability laws, maybe insurance companies. Yeah, one person back. Yeah, um, so my question is, with regards to all these mass shootings, um, have you, has there been a decision or an idea about a public health approach? Like what is, what's the best way for the, for the public health community to respond to these mass shootings? And the other is, what is the public health community doing in response to these mass shootings? Well, it's, it's hard for me to speak to the entire mental health, public health community, but basically one of the things to recognize is that um, mass shootings are an opportunity to make changes. So in, you know, virtually all the major changes in gun laws throughout the developed world have occurred after mass shootings, when people are suddenly, oh, we got to focus on this, because there's so many things to focus on. So uh, after Dunblane, you had, uh, in Scotland, you had major changes in the gun laws in uh, the United Kingdom. After um, Port Arthur massacre in, in Australia, you had enormous changes. And so this is the opportunity that people are talking about to try to do something. And so public health is trying to say, let's do something. In terms of the mass shootings, um, it's pretty clear, that even though people know it's done a study, that arming teachers is, is a crazy way. It's going to be very counterproductive for lots of reasons, and I can talk about that. Um, but I think this is an opportunity to, again, look at all our gun laws and, say, and, and our social norms and say, now is the time we've got to change. Because mass shootings are horrible and they get the news, but that's not the problem. You know, that's not the big problem. The, the, the big problem with mass shootings is now all kids have to have lockdown drills. That's the horrible and the real cost. But um, I was looking. I think uh, if you look at, ma at mass shootings in K through 12 schools in the last 20 years, we have lots and lots and lots. But there's only been um, 12 mass shootings in which four more people victims died. 
So, which is one reason army teachers are sort of crazy because you can't do anything when one person gets killed. You don't have to prove your host, you're going to save the person's dead. Um, and uh, you probably won't have any chance. You see, have one chance every two years in the 100,000 schools we have to really prevent something terrible from happening. I'm sorry, it's not four people dying, it's two people dying. So there are 12 cases where two victims have been killed. All right. And, and, and bringing guns in any place really increases the risk. So I, I think you know there are companies and there are people saying, what can schools do? And schools have to do something because if they don't, if anything bad happens, they'd be. But the big gun problems are have nothing to, I mean, schools are still the, by far the safest place to, to, to be. And, and, yeah, so what you want to do is, you got to do something about the gun. It's, every other developed country has figured out what to do to prevent these things. And there's nothing to do with mental health, there's nothing to do with, it has to do with don't let people get easy access to these incredibly legal weapons. So we'll take one more question, because he has a birthday celebration to get to. Yeah. And I'm voting back. Um, I've been working mainly on getting rid of the NRA on congressmen around the country. And uh, my question is, are the student groups in those high gun states that you yeah. acknowledge there as active? Do they have student groups in those states as well as the student groups? Y yeah, the yes, they do. I don't think they're strong because they're, they're pushing against too hard. Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, who, who did. The Parkland students are just incredible because they, you know, I met with them and they are using social media. And so they are. With everyone, much so much faster, much better than we we old oldies, you know, can figure out. And, and so so it's it's very exciting. But but what I do think is that every is what would be really useful is is to make it clear which people, which Congress people are getting money from the NRA or the holding. Yeah, but it's not a lot of things are public information, but it's not when you go to the polls, you don't know. Um, so it. Yeah, and and what you want is somehow force everybody to sort of answer three questions about how they, what they would vote on in terms of big issues, in terms of guns, and that might make it. The, the students are great because what they really want to do is mobilize, um, you know, 18, 18 to 24 year olds to get out and vote because that's the, the they, they are so much, I mean, who are the worst people are in terms of this issue are, the people who look like congressmen, who are all white males, who are above. And what you really, we would not have this problem if Congress looked like the electorate. If there are women, if there are minorities, that they are so much better than the old white guys who are just all. All right, let's give that. Thank you for coming out again. He actually took the time to come out tonight. We will do again for birthday celebration.